Hello, I'm Dr. Lewis Myers. Welcome to Healthcare Today. We're going to be talking today about common lung diseases or lung diagnoses uh, and how do we diagnose and treat those. And I'm very honored to have as our guest today Dr. Veronica Yedlovsky, who is the Chief of Pulmonology at Rutland Regional Medical Center. Dr. Yedlovsky will be joining us from Rutland via Zoom. Dr. Yedlovsky went to medical school in her native Hungary, then came to the United States where she did her residency training at Mount Sinai in New York City and her pulmonary and critical care at Columbia Hospital in New York City. She's been with us here in Vermont for many years. She was the director of critical care and pulmonology at the North Country Hospital uh, for a number of years and has been at Rutland, I believe, for three or four years now. So Dr. Yadlovsky, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me, it's very exciting. Well, we have a lot of things to cover. We're gonna talk about some of the more common things we see uh, at the hospital and in Vermont. Uh, these include COPD or emphysema and asthma, sleep apnea, lung cancer and lung cancer screening, and then perhaps at the end, we'll talk a little bit about COVID and the long COVID syndrome, how COVID has affected people's lungs. So let's start with very common uh, and smoking related disease of COPD. Um, tell us a, also how, what is COPD and how does it differ from asthma? So COPD is a lung disease that is um, caused by exposure to different irritants. In our country, the most common irritant that is involved is cigarette smoke. But certainly if we look worldwide, um, other exposures could be uh, wood fires or burning different uh, materials for heat and for cooking can also cause COPD. So, the C so COPD is, um, basically encompasses two different diseases. One is what we would call chronic bronchitis, which is an irritation from the smoke, irritating the mucous glands and the inner lining um, of the airways and causing permanent damage and permanent structural changes eventually. And the other form of COPD would be what people would know as emphysema, which is where the cigarette smoke eventually causes structural damage at the smallest part of the lung tissue called the alveoli and ruptures them and causes these bigger, what I usually explain to the patients as airfield bubbles in the lung that just don't participate in the breathing so well, but those are permanent uh, changes and damage in the lung. One of the other uh perhaps contributors here in Vermont, in Barrie, in Rutland, and other communities, is people who have worked in the granite quarries. Do you see much of that? So that usually uh, causes the granite quarries and also up north um, in Eden and Lowell, the asbestos mines. They tend to cause more interstitial lung disease rather than COPD. Um, and of course, if the person who worked in the quarries and the mines was also a smoker for many years, then their risk of developing severe lung disease is even higher than the general population. But those interstitial lung diseases would include pulmonary fibrosis, where there's actual scarring occurring on the lung rather than um, damage to these small breathing surfaces, the alveoli. How does smoking actually damage the lungs? to cause this COPD or, or emphysema? So it's partly the cigarette smoke and partly the actual burn products in the, the tobacco as it burns um, are the damaging factors. And as such, of course, it's, it doesn't have to be tobacco smoking. It could be marijuana. And the damage can also occur from not just smoking, but uh, vaping or using the bong or anything like that. We don't hear as much about marijuana, but there's perhaps some misconception that it doesn't cause harm to the lungs. Is, you're saying that's not true? No, it does cause harm to the lung. I think that the reason why we don't hear all that much about it, perhaps, is um, 
most people don't smoke at so much marijuana, which would be maybe an equivalent to a pack of cigarettes a day, every single day. There is also the perception that when people cut back on their smoking that they can undo the damage or prevent damage. Is that true? So some of the damage is permanent, but some of the damage is actually reversible. And as people cut back or quit smoking, some of the reversible damage can be um, mitigated and can get better. So for example, we're talking about um, how the mucous glands are starting to put out more mucus. And before those glands go through a permanent change, they could be just irritated and inflamed. And that can get better with the irritation seizing. How do you diagnose COPD or emphysema? So COPD is diagnosed partly by getting a good history, um, including exposure history, and then partly by physical exam. Most of the time, by the time the airways are involved, we hear that people have some wheezing when, we, when they exhale, there's some coughing, there is chronic mucus production. And then um, the actual definitive diagnosis would be made on, in conjunction with the history, would be made on pulmonary function testing, which is a lung function test where they measure how much air one can move with different maneuvers. And there are very specific findings for obstructive lung disease like asthma and COPD. And of course, if we get a CAT scan or any kind of imaging modality, um, we could also see changes that reflect that the person might have COPD or emphysema. And once you have a patient with COPD, what are some of the treatment options that you have? So number one is stopping whatever the irritation is that's causing the, the COPD. So the smokers do very extensive work in um, smoking cessation counseling and offering resources and medications to help people quit smoking. Number two is based on the severity of the disease and the patient's symptomatology, we can offer inhalers, which uh, different medications are put into the inhalers, but some of them will relax these um, tightened airways um, in different mechanisms and help the airway open up bigger. So that can help with the wheezing and the shortness of breath and some other medications in the inhalers, such as some of the uh, inhaled steroids, perhaps help with the inflammation around the mucous glands. There are other medications that are also used in the care of the patient with COPD, but in more specific um, situations or scenarios. For example, for patients who have very frequent uh, flare-ups, lending them in the hospital or in the emergency room. Uh, we have other medications that are proven to help slow down the frequency of these flare-ups. And then lastly, we do pulmonary exercise rehabilitation program to help uh, the person learn how to use the remaining healthy lung in a more efficient way and exercise specifically the respiratory accessory muscles that help with some of the symptoms, especially the breathlessness. And then we also um, encompass um, kind of a more overall care, such as making sure that the vaccinations are on board. Mm -hmm. And if a patient needs supplemental oxygen, then prescribing the appropriate amount of oxygen. Which are the, mo which are the important vaccines for people, someone with COPD to, to, to get? So for people with COPD, um, age-appropriate pneumonia vaccination is very important and the guidelines changed a little while ago. So um, uh, pay, uh, people with basically any significant COPD um, at any age would now qualify for pneumonia vaccines. Um, yearly flu shots, the COVID vaccinations, and um, the RSV vaccination, which just came out this year, would be, I think, my top four choices. And let's, if we could, switch gears and just talk a little bit about asthma. Again, very common. Um, tell us what is asthma and how is it different than COPD? 
So asthma, uh, in some ways, there are some similarities and then in some other ways, it's a very different disease. Asthma is more of a reactive airway disease. So this is more of an illness of the airways, the windpipes, kind of the tubing system, whereas COPD a lot of the times involves the actual lung tissue. Um, and asthma, most people have a tendency for a hyperreactive reaction. So they are um, inhaling some sort of an irritant that they are basically allergic to, and that causes a very abrupt change in the otherwise healthy looking normal airways where suddenly the airway tightens up, the muscle ring there around the airway also gets tight and the mucus glands can acutely start producing mucus. The symptoms could be quite similar once the patient is in a asthma attack, they will have shortness of breath and coughing and wheezing and chest tightness, but it has a more transient nature and has a very strong association to exposure to the irritant. So in between times, the asthma patient may feel completely fine. Has the treatment of asthma changed over the years during your practice years? So in the last few years, major changes has ha have happened in the asthma care by um, initially by the recognition of these very specific allergy mediating cells in the blood called eosinophil cells, that patients who have a large number of these eosinophil cells in their blood, they tend to react much more abruptly to exposure to inhaled irritants and cause severe asthma flare-ups. And so now if we screen these um, asthma patients and find that their blood has a lot of these eosinophil cells, there are injectable asthma medications that came on the market about probably at this point eight or nine years ago. Some of them are once every two weeks, the other one is every month, and there's one on the market that, that is once every two months. But basically the bottom line is that these medications block these allergic cells, these um, eosinophil cells in the blood. And with that, they make the, the patient much less prone to severe abrupt um, asthma attacks. They tend to work very well for the right patient. They also tend to be very expensive. Uh, <clears throat> is that true? They, they are expensive. There is a lot of, um, so the insurance is pretty well recognized the value of these uh, medications in keeping people away from having bad enough flare-ups that land them in the emergency room in the intensive care unit or God forbid on a ventilator. Um, and also these medications decrease the need for taking steroids like prednisone on a long-term basis, which have a lot of long-term side effects. So keeping people healthy enough not to have to do that overall is a major healthcare saving. So I think that insurance companies by now fairly well recognize that, and they usually cover one or the other medication. They may not cover all of them. And uh, most of the drug companies have also have some patients assistance programs so for the right patient, if uh, financial constraints are an issue, our clinics are definitely well worth to help them figure out a way to get them to one of these medications. It sounds like with COPD, we've made some progress, but with asthma, we're probably making even more progress toward controlling the, the symptoms, controlling the disease. I think that this is, true that I think that these injectable medications were groundbreaking. There is another big new change coming in the asthma world. So the uh, national asthma guidelines and the GINA guidelines, which is basically the two big guidelines uh, of our therapies are now have changed and they're kind of getting into the pulmonary and primary care communities. Um, a com uh, basically, um, starting these what they call smart asthma therapy and it's a huge paradigm shift in the way how we think about asthma and how we think about asthma care 
So I think it's going to take some time until everybody will be comfortable with that mindset. But basically, what we used to have controller inhalers that the person had to take every day, no fail, all the time. And then we had albuterol, which was what we called an rescue or emergency um, or as needed inhaler. The new guidelines are, especially for mild to moderate asthma, are really prioritizing using one specific maintenance inhaler that has a combination of a steroid and a long acting bronchial dilator to be used on an as needed basis, which was never yeah. uh, before kind of the mindset. So this is gonna be very interesting. So and, let me uh, ask you this, if a, if a patient, whether either asthma or COPD is seeing their primary care provider and they're still experiencing some difficulties. When when would be a good time for a referral to a pulmonologist, such so as I yourself? Think, so I think that if, um, first of all, if there is a question about we if whether or not we have the diagnosis right or wrong, it's always a good t uh, time to refer because we have more um, tools to try to really make sure that the person whose complaint was coughing and shortness of breath and was labeled with asthma actually has asthma and we're not missing some other diagnosis. Um, I think if the person has like a mild intermittent asthma, very seldom has flare-ups, generally is in good control, I think it's appropriate to stay with primary care. If there is um, frequent flare-ups or a feeling that the current medication regimen is just not controlling the asthma well, it would be a good time um, to refer to pulmonology. And I think that sort of the same holds true for COPD is if the treatment regimen has to be escalated and even that's not working well, it's not a bad idea to kind of um, have a referral let us see the patient, we'll give treatment recommendations, or we'll co-manage with primary care, depending on, you know, a lot of the, the different variables, how far the patient is coming from, how comfortable they are with taking back the management, or how much they want us to co-manage. I'd like to move on to talk about sleep apnea, which I know you're very involved in. You, you run the sleep lab at uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center and have done some special training in sleep studies. Um, it's a very common problem. We see it in primary care quite a bit. Certainly as the population has gained weight over the years, uh, that has exacerbated the problem because often it's associated with, uh, with overweight. Can you talk a little bit about what is sleep apnea, how you diagnose it, and how you treat it? So sleep apnea is a very common problem and it's becoming more common in a pediatric population as well. So we're seeing both adults and kids with sleep disordered breathing in our clinic. In terms of sleep apnea, there is actually two different kinds of sleep apnea, but when we say sleep apnea, we just mean what's actually called obstructive sleep apnea, which is about, I would say, 90, 95% of the people with sleep apnea, but there is this minor group that is a central sleep apnea, which is a completely different disease and treated differently and has very different risk factors. But since that's a um, pretty small portion of the pie, I would focus on the obstructive sleep apnea just right now. So that is um, related to the airway, the upper airway, um, getting actually obstructed by either the tongue pushing back or extra tissues around the neck, just the weight of the tissues as we fall asleep, kind of falling on the main airway or the jaw pushing backwards and again, obstructing the upper main airway. And that is what results in snoring. And when the snoring ceases and the actual obstruction happens, that's when people have the apnea, which is a pause in the breathing. And the main danger of that is that when somebody is not breathing for 30 or 40 or 50 seconds, there is no oxygen or coming to the body. And from there, 
since there's no oxygen coming to the lungs, there's no oxygen going to the blood system, into the heart, into the brain. And overall, this could be very damaging to our vital organs. And how do you diagnose sleep apnea? So sleep apnea is diagnosed with um, what's called a sleep study. There is basically two ways of doing a sleep study. The gold standard being an in lab sleep study where the patient comes in, spends the night in the sleep center, and we monitor 18 or so different parameters, including brain waves and breathing and oxygen and respiratory effort and heart and limb movements and all kinds of different things. Short of that, for the right patient in an appropriate setting, um, there is also something called a home sleep study that can be done, which is kind of um, a little bit more rudimentary um, assessment, more specific to just sleep apnea, does not really assess for any other sleep disorders. Um, but again, for the right patient, it could be a little bit more expedited way of getting a diagnosis and moving on to treatment. And so that treatment. would involve and let's taking... talk about treatment. Once you know that someone has at least moderate to severe sleep apnea, what are the treatment options? So for, so for severe sleep apnea, really the best treatment option is to use a positive pressure machine, either a CPAP machine or BiPAP machine, which basically generates an extra force to the air, um, uh, which is then goes through a mask and it basically keeps the extra tissues aside and serves like a pneumatic splint. It splints the upper airway open. Um, that is what's um, approved for severe sleep apnea. Now for mild to moderate sleep apnea, the CPAP machine will still work just as well. But for those folks, there are other treatment options. So weight loss definitely helps. But for the patients who are not overweight, who do not have um, too much extra tissue around the neck, um, there's also something called an oral appliance, which is a dental device made specifically by sleep dentists. And it's something that the person only wears at night. It fits over the teeth and it basically gently anchors the lower jaw to the upper jaw and the jaw from flopping back. For um, kids especially, but some adults, um, tonsillectomy could make all the difference, if, uh, especially if we see children with very large tonsils and some sleep apnea that could solve all of their problems. Um, the uvula resection and pharyngeoplasty is kind of falling out of favor, not great results overall for adults. But then um, on the commercials, I'm sure your viewers are seeing all the time about the Inspire device, which is a, a nerve stimulating device that uh, is almost like a pacemaker built into the right side of the chest wall and the pacing wires are going to the nerve that innervates the muscle that holds the jaw in place. And so well, it's basically- I, I, I certainly know from my experience in primary care that when people have their sleep apnea effectively treated, they feel so much better. They have more energy during the day. They can concentrate. Um, a lot of things improve. This is one area where definitely I think, I would think people should be seeking out a specialist uh, so that they can get diagnosed and treated appropriately because most primary care providers are not set up to necessarily diagnose and treat sleep apnea. Uh, let me, yeah. Let's talk to you briefly about lung cancer. This is Lung Cancer Screening Month, traditionally November, although it should be year-round. Um, what are our screening options now? Who do we screen for lung cancer? And how do we screen it? So lung cancer screening guidelines changed just within the last few years. But um, the idea is that patients who are smokers, active smokers, or who have quit within 15 years should be screened for lung cancer. Uh, based on the new guidelines, this is now age 50 and above. Active smokers and people who have quit within 15 years and the smoking history also has changed 
but basically the equivalent to one pack a day for 20 years is the new guideline. So if somebody either smoked in the past one pack a day for 20 years or two packs a day for 10 years, they would qualify for the screening. The screening is done with a CT scan, which is a picture of the lung, a little bit more sophisticated than an X-ray, but doesn't take a whole lot longer than doing a chest X-ray. And in fact, the radiation dose used for this particular CAT scan is not a whole lot more than a chest X-ray, a little bit more, but not a whole lot more. Does not require contrast shot or contrast administration. So this is a non-contrast CT scan once a year. Are insurance companies, under the guidelines you just talked about, are insurance companies, most of them covering this now? Yes, so this is a mandatory coverage by the um, Affordable Care Act. And um, this is part of just like our mammograms and um, colonoscopies that are mandatory covered for the right patient. And it cannot be counted against the person's deductible either. As we know, lung cancer remains the number one most common fatal cancer in the United States, but the numbers are improving. Certainly a lot of that has to do with far less people are smoking or smoking heavily in the United States now, but is some of the difference, you think, from the screening? Absolutely. So I think that there, the difference comes from two major improvements and major advancements in lung cancer care in the last 10 years. One is the widespread availability of lung cancer screening. We're actually finding much smaller cancerous tumors when they are um, surgically resectable and curable. And the other advancement is just in the surgical techniques and the radiation um, techniques that we use now. Um, the, uh, the survival rate for small cancers has, have improved a great deal. And some of the chemotherapy is becoming much more specific and uh, uh, for the, the kind of cancers that people often have. Um, let's, yeah. in, our, in the remaining time we have, let's talk about COVID. You've taken care of people through the COVID epidemic and it unfortunately continues, uh, although perhaps not as severe as we saw in the first year or two of the epidemic. How is, in terms of people's lung function and pulmonary function, how is COVID changing? And also, could you talk a little bit about long COVID and how that affects people's lungs? So during the acute COVID infection, um, some people, as you know, get through it very quickly and, um, and without much problem with a little bit of a runny nose. And, and some people really, really get sick and get admitted to the hospital or to the intensive care unit. It's still difficult to tell or predict who is going to do well or who is going to do poorly. Um, uh, but certainly, um, immunization against COVID has made a big difference in how well people did overall when they got infected. Um, the people who do end up uh, in the intensive care unit or on the ventilator tend to have the COVID lung infection involving more deeper um, parenchymal tissue of the lung, um, causing a lot of inflammation, um, kind of swelling inside the lung tissue. Um, when that heals, it can heal with scarring, and that could be a permanent damage to the lung tissue and make the lung kind of more of a stiff, rigid organ and not be able to process the oxygen so well. So that could be a long-term sequelae of having severe COVID lung infection. When you see a, 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 a severe form of the COVID that's affecting the lungs, are there any Aside from the couple of the IV medications or Paxlovid, are there any specific pulmonary interventions that you think can prevent this scarring? So there's very specific, so, so it depends on how sick the patient is, but for um, very severely ill patients, especially on a ventilator, there are specific ventilation strategies that we use for COVID. Um, one of them is, um, using the prone positioning, 
uh, while the patient is ventilated and changing the positions, um, uh, using some in uh, IV steroids as well as the antiviral medications. Um, well, it's been a learning process for everyone, and in, obviously including the pulmonologists and critical care specialists such as yourself. We've covered a lot of topics here in a short period of time and, and really only scratched the surface, but I want to thank you for being here. Uh, it's been really helpful. Um, Dr. Veronica Yudlowski is the head of pulmonary and critical care, head of pulmonary care at Rutland Regional Medical Center. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me.